and uh, we're the Open Sciad Research Agenda team, and we're really excited to introduce this uh, seed funding opportunity uh, in conjunction with the Carnegie Corporation of New York uh, to just help get exciting ideas on research related to Open Sciad off the ground, uh, which is our main our main goal for this project. Um, so here's a here's a quick overview of what we'll be doing. Um, We'll just give a little bit of background on Open Sciad and the research agenda, the activities so far through the first year of the work. For those of you who've been following us, uh, either in our previous like uh, webinar plenary sessions or our, uh, our white papers that have been released, um, this will all be familiar to you, but I just wanted to be sure that people who have not been following are on the same page. So just a little bit of background on that before we get into the seed funding opportunity itself, right? So it's just trying to talk about the logistics, right? What's the purpose and kind of the, the amount and grant period, right? What we're expecting from the awardees. Uh, also, what will be our role in that uh, in terms of application, right? The eligibility and the priorities that we'll be, we'll be using for selection of awards. And we'll talk about the, some details of the application process and leave some time at the end for Q and A, and so the Q and A session. You know, we're certainly we certainly hope we can answer as many questions as we can. We're expecting that some people will ask questions we haven't thought of, in which case we'll we'll table them and we'll document them, and then we'll post them on an FAQ later to make sure that we do get all those questions answered uh, when the application is released. All right, so with that, uh, let's just get into it. Uh, so, uh, Open Syed. Uh, set of Creative Commons license, uh, freely available materials, right? Addressing NGSS, you know, currently um, kind of finishing up the middle school grades and going into the high school grades. There are a few special materials I think that are available through grade 11, um, uh, but that's the current scope. And, you know, the, the genesis of this project is that, you know, these unique uh, design features and affordances of open side materials, we really feel like it uniquely enables research uh, that's, that's really needed about teaching, learning, and, and classroom implementation. Um, you know, it, it offers uh, really unique opportunities relative to ordinary curriculum materials, um, both in terms of the pedagogical approach and the ways that uh, uh, open, openly available and modifiable materials can be can be used and adopted uh, by schools and districts. Um, so uh, we really feel like there's huge opportunity there to examine new questions about deep engagement of K-12 students uh, in STEM, right? And these these findings really have a chance to, to promote desirable outcomes in, in unique ways. So um, the, the research agenda project uh, the, the goal is really to help the field identify the most pressing questions uh, for research enabled by Open Syed, right? So by research, we mean research broadly, right? Which can include this related design and development, improvement, evaluation, and, and, and other related ideas, right? We're trying to help uh, connect like-minded partners to move this kind of work forward. Um, and uh, one of our main goals is really to support the refinement of people's uh, innovative ideas about open science research and development into high quality, competitive, submittable research proposals, right? And so the three criteria that we've been uh, emphasizing throughout this process, right, is that we want these research ideas uh, as in the triangle on the right, right? They should kind of uniquely leverage open science distinctiveness, right? In other words, the work that's being done uh, really requires open science to be done and couldn't just be conducted just using any set of curriculum materials, right? We want to make sure that uh, uh, the work promotes equity, uh, it being uh, uh, and a really important goal of the materials themselves, as well as in STEM education broadly, right? And uh, of course, it should address uh, pressing gaps and needs in science education and related areas, right? Including curriculum broadly, assessment, uh, educational technologies and so on. So those are the main criteria we used uh, to help identify the most pressing areas for potential research with Open Sciad. Um, just a quick word on kind of 
uh, how we've what we've done to this point, right? Uh, some of you were probably involved in these working groups, but we convened uh, working groups uh, of 79 people of from various backgrounds, uh, not just researchers, but all kinds of stakeholders, right? And we grouped these uh, attendees into five topic areas okay, right here. And we engage them in a series of uh, three meetings to basically generate and refine uh, research questions. And we analyze the artifacts from the three parallel sessions that we conducted uh, with each group. And we kind of came away with these four themes. And these are articulated in our white paper that was just released a couple of weeks ago and is available on our, on our, um, on our landing page. And these four themes were um, you know, promoting student agency and participation in science, and especially promoting the vision of the K-12 framework. Okay. Um, the third one was uh, questions about adoption, implementation, and the sustainability uh, of open science. And then fourth, around materials customization and adaptation. And we noticed after identifying those four themes that the first two uh, kind of speak to what really matters and to whom do those things matter, right? And the second two are kind of about the how, right? How, how does open SIAD happen? Right? Where is it happening? Who makes it happen? Uh, so that's kind of how it shook out according to our synthesis of the working group artifacts. And again, these are in our uh, white paper, which I encourage people to, to, to look at. And that kind of brings us right to where we are right now. So that was the uh, the release of the white paper represented the end of our first year of the work on this project. And really the second year is what we're kicking off right now. And the second year is devoted to identifying teams of researchers um, to move their ideas forward into competitive, uh, larger research proposals. And we're very interested in supporting people and developing those proposals. So now we're getting to the seed funding opportunity. Um, and so the, the gist of, of the seed funding opportunity right, is that we have support from the Carnegie Corporation. Uh, basically, we've got $60,000, right? And, and so depending on, on the applications we get, that would represent uh, six to 10 seed grants of six to $10,000 each uh, to support these team's efforts to advance uh, some open side related proposal concept. Um, so, what we want is, uh, our goal is to have a good number, all of them, uh, if possible, result in the submission of a competitive grant. And we're just picking the number um, a quarter of a million dollars or more, right? The idea is not to support you in just getting another planning grant, right? So we really wanna make sure that this is something that's gonna be its own work. Oh, I, I just remembered that um, we didn't uh, notify people if we were, that we were recording this. And uh, I can't, did uh, Zareen or Carly, did you hit the record button? Yes, uh, we are recording. We are, okay. I was, I was supposed to let people know that, but uh, just so you can monitor your participation so, so that you know, so that we can make sure that others can, can view this uh, afterward. All right, um, let's see, where was I? Yeah, quarter million or more, right? The idea is that this leads to some, um, uh, you know, a substantial uh, research and or development uh, project uh, on its own, right? And we have in mind, you know, federal programs like uh, IES, NSF, uh, philanthropic foundations, or any other grant awarding organizations, right? And again, I, we're thinking research broadly, right? So research and research adjacent activities, which can include design development, evaluation, synthesis, you know, or something else that, that you can articulate that is aligned with kind of the distinctiveness of open side materials, right? And uh, we did identify these four themes in the white paper and can certainly uh, propose to address one or more of these themes, but it's not necessarily required, right? The idea is that one can articulate a clear, a clear need and urgency for, for that work. And if that's something that isn't necessarily addressed directly in our white paper, that's completely fine. So we were envisioning that these seed grants, right, could be used uh, by scholars to um, really the kinds of things that would help uh, 
teams really advance their proposal concept in, in various ways, right? So these are all examples, right? You can travel. Uh, I found it helpful in my proposal work to engage uh, experts in certain areas uh, to just to kind of work as, as consultants uh, or to read proposal drafts and give feedback, right? If you're in a position to support a graduate student uh, to do preliminary work, like a lit review or preliminary data analysis, uh, it's a good example. Um, you know, other, other people that would be in a position to give valuable input um, or, or any other, other expenses, right? So um, just a little bit of extra, just to relieve the burden of where the, where the resources would be needed to, to support these, uh, these kinds of activities that would lead to a competitive proposal. Um, so from the, uh, from the grantees, right, we're envisioning during the, during the proposal period of performance, which would be from about um, February until September, um, right, that the Digital Promise team would, would meet with, with proposal teams, um, schedule regular check-ins. Uh, we would help you identify a specific program that is a, that is a particularly good fit to your concept. Uh, to just help you, basically to help you in any way that you need help in advancing your, uh, in advancing your uh, proposal concept, right? So that it can be submitted to one of these programs. Uh, we'd like uh, sort of to, to help monitor your progress and because it's good proposal, proposal writing practice, right? To produce kind of the kind of artifacts that would demonstrate progress uh, toward a competitive proposal, which could be other concept papers, uh, reviews of literature, uh, you know, articulating the research design, and and certainly we're happy to read and give feedback on proposal drafts, as well as any other any other supportive activities you can think of. Um, and then uh, what we would want is for teams to uh, provide evidence that uh, they've actually submitted their proposal uh, during the period of performance. Um, and in this case, um, the, the, since the period of performance goes until September 30th. Right, we were going through the potential opportunities, particularly the federal competitions. And we feel like September 30th actually aligns quite well with the range of relevant proposal opportunities. Um, even the latest ones in 2022, which include competitions like uh, DRK-12, I think CORE and RETL, all occur in the first half of October of 2022. RETL, I think being the latest one, which is around like the 16th or 17th. And so we feel like that is a reasonable time frame uh, to be able to submit a proposal by the end of the uh, by the end of the period of performance. And all the other proposals or deadlines occur in August and July and before. So that's our thinking uh, in terms of the proposal submission. Um, our role, I kind of alluded to this, right? Um, but uh, in general, we're just there to provide thought partnership and, and feedback and any support. That, that meets uh, the recipient's needs. Um, we're also happy to facilitate interactions across different seed funding teams, should that be appropriate and desired by those teams, right? So um, we're experienced in uh, facilitating activities that get people giving critical feedback. Uh, people may know them as things like value creation sessions or sort of cr critical friends kind of sessions. So that kind of feedback from another team could turn out to be uh, really helpful. And we'd be happy to facilitate those kinds of interactions, right? And uh, I think I kind of talked about these things. We could we can help find collaboration partners. Just basically be thought partners and uh, help you engage in in uh, some reflection on these artifacts. All right. So in terms of who we're envisioning uh, would apply, right? So these would be people um, who would be able to serve as a principal investigator or lead on a grant proposal like the ones I've described, right? We're expecting people to be in STEM education, learning sciences and STEM disciplines, um, you know, the kind of folks who, who would be interested in moving research forward on STEM curriculum materials, teaching and, and practice. Uh, so an important thing is that we will be giving priority to early career scholars, you know, and or uh, our, our aim is not to, you know, if we've got six to $10,000, we're not going to give 
give it to people who already have a strong history of many multi-million dollar grants, right? We wanna also keep in mind to sort of support people who wanna advance um, their research program and could really benefit from that support. So people who don't have an extensive history of research grant funding and early career uh, scholars, right? We encourage uh, individuals from underrepresented groups uh, and MSIs uh, to, to apply, so all are welcome. And uh, sorry, was I hearing a sound? Okay. Um, and uh, you know, an example of uh, what uh, what the seed funding could be used for, for instance, if you're in a position to submit a, a career grant, for instance, right? Or there are uh, opportunities specific to uh, emerging scholars or MSIs, uh, that would be a very appropriate application of the seed funds. Okay, so here's the timeline. Uh, we are in the process of finalizing the application materials. Um, so we're gonna release it by uh, November 15th, I think is next, next Monday, right? So next Monday, it will be available on our, on our uh, landing page at Digital Promise. Uh, I think that's going into the chat. Um, we're pretty easy to find. You just find, look for OpenSciat or Google OpenSciat at Digital Promise, and you can find us there. Um, so we'll uh, put the deadline at, uh, for applications at December 17th. We'll, we'll review them. We'll talk about the review process in a second, but get back to, um, to everyone by January 31st. And then the grant period will be from February 1st until, until September 30th. And the, the application process will basically be in two parts. We'll have an online form, basically just describe your background. So we get a, a picture of who you are professionally. Um, we're going to have a, a brief personal equity statement, um, just so you know we we really value the the experiences and uh, that people bring uh, that are relevant to uh, addressing educational equity. It is a central part of this project for the research agenda to be to be equity centered, and so um, we just sort of want to hear. I think it's 150 words, just a little bit about how it is that. Um, your experiences have helped you address equity in your work. Um, uh, to, to describe the kind of activities you think will be beneficial to you, um, that we you know what basically what you plan to use the seed funds for, um, and to identify tentatively, you know, some possible funding programs. You wouldn't be committed to those particular programs. We just want to have an idea of where you see this idea potentially having a good fit and being funded. And then uh, the second part is uh, everyone will attach uh, 1,000 words or roughly two pages of text. We didn't want it to be a big lift. It's just a preliminary concept, right? And uh, you know, feel free to use extra room for the figures tables references, but basically two pages that just gives us an overview of your concept, right? Like why is it needed? What questions are you, are you thinking of answering? What are the empirical and theoretical perspectives that are relevant? You know, if there's a research design or development approach, you know, as needed, talk about that. You know, what sort of people might you work with uh, in this work? And, and primarily, you know, we want these concept papers to illustrate, you know, alignment with our three primary criteria of center equity, sort of being uniquely enabled by open site affordances and design, right, and addressing gaps and needs. Um, We've purposely left this concept paper pretty open. Um, you know, you notice there's no particular format or sections or headers or anything like that. We, we've done that on purpose just because we don't want to constrain this since this is so early in the process, right? This is a very generative period for kind of figuring out proposal concept. We want to make sure people can be creative and they can communicate in the way that makes sense to them. We didn't want to put too many constraints on your thinking and expression by requiring too many, um, a very specific format. So um, just to allow maximum expressivity on your part to, to discuss your idea. Um, so that's the reason that, right, it's really whatever you think gets across your idea the best in those thousand words. And then uh, for review, um, 
you know, we'll make sure that everything's there. Reach out to people if you know, if you feel like we're missing something. And uh, we will have a peer review panel that's uh, very familiar with the research agenda and open SIAD specifically to review the proposals and we'll, you know, we'll rate them. We'll rate the, the applications holistically, right? Essentially on, um, you know, they're, they're fit to these three criteria and also for a priority of being early career researchers or scholars. So that's all I have. And the rest of the time, really, we just wanted to let everyone ask questions about anything that wasn't clear, um, anything we didn't think of. So it's fine to speak up or type into the chat. And uh, Carly and Zareen can monitor the chat and let me know if, like, what's in the queue. And we'll just do our best to answer or let you know we'll, we'll find the answer and be sure to, to put it on an FAQ. Uh, the contact is me. Kevin in the chat, one of the questions, can pilot studies be considered for funding? Pilot studies. I mean, pilot study is pretty broad. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to trying to undo. How do I? Uh, there we go. I put my. Okay, now I can look at everyone. Um, can you clarify what you mean by pilot study? Like, for instance, if you apply to IES under like the design and development strand for one point six million dollars, they call the final study of your intervention a pilot study, right? So. Uh, yeah, certainly by the definition of if you have something that you want to sort of test for the first time and get preliminary evidence of, of effectiveness or a promise of effectiveness, right, defined that way, certainly. But that might not be what, um, what was meant by pilot study. I mean, basically, if it's if it's something, if the scope of work is something that's worthy of being funded for a quarter million dollars, that's kind of the the judge of it, right? That the the funding amount speaks to the um, speaks to the kind of scope and um, and substance of the work. So, if you want to call it a pilot study, then I think that's fine. Another question from the chat, should we indicate a certain course or context in the application? Course or course, what, what, what does course mean? Uh, oh, oh, so for instance, if you're course, oh, like in a particular open SIAD unit? Yes, yes, I, I asked this question. So I meant uh, if you wanted to, for example, to answer a specific research question, uh, should we mention uh, the exact site or the exact course that we will be using to analyze the data and such things? Or it should be kind of like the concept in general about like, you know, our vision, what design for equity mean, and then uh, uh, indicate like several potential courses that we will include. So do we need to be specific or it could be general? And then the other question I also put in the chat about how can we find a, a partner uh, so we can team up? Okay, so in terms of a course, I mean, it, it really does, this is sort of vague, but it really does depend on the research questions, right? If you have compelling research questions where, you know, the, the decision of what context or course is, is still open, right? And that, would, that, would, that could be part of the work that we would support, then I think that's appropriate, right? Now, there, there are certain research questions for which it would make sense to be more specific about these contexts, right? Like if your question is about, 
life science, something about life science learning, right? Then you might want to identify a life science unit, right? Or, you know, similarly, if they're specific to a particular grade band, then you want to be specific about that, right? So I think it, it really does depend on one's research questions. Um, for this, what was the second question? Um, I have a question about how can we find a partner who is doing uh, something similar? So my uh, my work in general is more focused on MOOCs, and I have previously done several works on uh, looking at MOOCs from Design for Equity Vision and see uh, how can we adapt and personalize students' experiences at the largest scale and more specifically in open uh, education uh, kind of like learning environment not in these smokes where students have to obey so yeah so i was just thinking if we can find a partner because i tried that with the uh, coursera MOOCs, but i also interested in looking at it um uh, in different platforms and things like that so i was just thinking if there is someone who's doing something similar and how can we find uh these people i mean i think um if you have someone that you already know you want to work with, so we plan to fund one particular applicant, right? To, you know, uh, we expect to be able to um, just basically award the funds to your institution in the sort of the usual way that a grant would be awarded, right? And it would be up to the lead to decide how to use those funds, right? And if that means to, that you would then give the funds to people that you work with on your end to advance the proposal, then that would be your decision as the, as the seed fund award lead. Um, and in terms of identif identifying partners up front, it really varies, right? Uh, again, if there's someone that you think is a particularly good fit for the work and, and you and someone else jointly kind of want to pursue this idea with us, that also, that works. It also works that, um, if that's something that we can support you in finding appropriate partners, right? If you have this concept, right? And you say, well, part of what I could use support on is finding a good partner to work with, that's fine too. So if we do so, uh, so you said like it, it has to be through the institution. So if I know, I'm assistant professor at Pepperdine, but then I know someone like at UTA, University of Texas, Austin. So should it go through my institution or his institution, for example? It should go through whoever is is going to be lead of the of okay. the proposal, right? So the applicants should be whoever intends to be principal investigator or lead of the sure. social charge proposal. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I see a question. On who, is that the one you were looking at too, Carly? Um, the one I wanted to, to sort of build off of, can you expand on the idea of who can be the lead or PI for the seed grant? Can we have one lead and one PI that is two people? Um, so clarification of how might a team represent themselves versus a single PI in the application? Um, whoever is the lead on the seed funding application for us, right, is who we would award the funds to. We, so we'd, fund, we'd, we'd award the funds to your institution, right? So one of you, one of the two of you would be the lead on our, our seed grant to you. And we would expect that same person to be the, the lead or PI. I, I, I use those terms interchangeably because for instance, if you're applying to a, to a philanthropic foundation, they don't always call the person who leads the work, the principal investigator. That's kind of a federal grant award term, right? But if, if you were to be submitting, for instance, to NSF or IES, then we would expect the person we award the seed funds to, to be able to be the principal investigator on that grant proposal. Right, or to be the person who's essentially responsible for all project work from a foundation grant, should it be awarded from them. Right, and so you know, if you look at um, you know the request for proposals from NSF, for instance, right, they say 
there are no restrictions on who can be principal investigator of an award, right? So, you know, while it doesn't, you know, re necessarily require any particular level of, of education or position, right? Typically, you should be prepared to be the principal, to, to be able to serve as principal investigator, right? You have the resources, the facilities, right? The same criteria that, that NSF, for instance, would look at in determining whether you were suitable to be the principal investigator of that proposal. We have a, a raised hand. Feel free to turn on your mic and speak up. <laughs> so my other question is, if we're gonna send you uh, the draft of the proposal, would you look at it? And if so, like, like what would be the amount of time that you need to look at it and provide feedback? I mean, if this is gonna be over, um, seven months right february through september so we're envisioning a very extended process of support right where you know we're not just gonna early mm -hmm. on we're envisioning that uh grant uh seed funding recipients would at first articulate a plan for how these seven months are going to evolve between you and the digital promise team um right and so and you might set uh a set of milestones, for instance, of how far you're gonna to get toward the proposal at different junctures, right? And the proposal drafts are gonna to be toward the end, right? If you have a proposal deadline of September 15th, right? You might wanna have kind of a, at least a full draft one to two months ahead of that so that it can be iterated, right? And a lot's gonna happen between the beginning of the funding period and your draft, right? That's where you refine the concept, get 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 ideas, create outlines, um, uh, and you know literature reviews and so on, right? So we're envisioning it being a gradual process. Um, you know, I, I I can't put a, a an amount of time on it, right? But we're we're very eager to work sort of on a on a continuous basis, right? Certainly monthly, I would think. There would be at oh, least okay. hopefully check-ins with us, sessions and other meetings that we can facilitate. Oh, nice. So we're going to have like a weekly, uh, I mean, monthly meetings like this. Yeah, that's right. Where we would get okay. together oh. and we would provide thought partnership and whatever feedback nice, and, nice. and advice, right? From, you know, we have people on our team who are experienced proposal writers, right? Who can give that kind of guidance to folks who um, are less experienced. Okay. Um, I see a question from Monica on representing like a team versus a single PI. Um, so uh, we're thinking that uh, the, the PI would be the lead, right? But there will be a, a, a prompt in the online application to describe who will you be working with. And in response to that prompt, you can describe the other members of the team who would work under your leadership, right? And again, we would award the funds to the, the primary applicant who would, who would be our main point of contact and who would lead the proposal development on your end, but certainly your whole team, right? You would, you would manage the team and the collaboration and everyone would be invited to join whatever check-ins that you had with Digital Promise. Does that answer the question, Monica? Okay, great. I see you, there you are. I have another question on team related question. Can you say more about the priority for early career researchers? Could it be that a member of the team is an early career, others in the team and the organization or the lead are more established? Um, that's a really good question. Um, let me run that one by the team. My, my immediate reaction is that if you're in a position to be working closely with other people on the team who are highly established, um, then you probably have a lot of mentoring resources from them 
and experience. Um, and that that's not really the opportunity to, that we're envisioning. Um, but let us think about that. That's actually good. I, th I think it depends on the role that you envision, right? Um, you know, if you're gonna propose that uh, you're gonna apply for say a, say a $2 million grant, right? And you're gonna subcontract out, you know, 1 million of that to very established partners. Um, I mean, if it, I, I, th I think it depends. I, and I think that would, if, let's put that in our FAQ and we'll think about that a little more closely. I realize why that's sort of an in-between case, right? While, while we wanna support promising ideas and the efforts of early career scholars, um, you know, I, I don't wanna be sure that we were being, being fair in supporting the people who really uniquely need DP support. So it's a good question. Thanks for raising it. Kevin, there's another question from Denise. Um, she's saying that she realizes Open Syed has existing materials. Could we use the seed funding to develop new materials to add to the collection? Um, I mean, there's a consortium, so I'm not sure exactly what that means, right? I mean, Carnegie and, and other uh, foundations, Gates, and, you know, the whole consortium of funders who supports the development of the open side materials that go on their website. Um, I mean, that's an established team, right, who are producing those. Now, if, if by other materials you mean uh, a potential proposal could be to modify those materials with some particular purpose, right? Because one of the key affordances of open side materials is that they are adaptable and customizable. And that's a very important question that's emerged in terms of what kind of, um, what kind of things can these, these customizations actually achieve with regard to promoting student learning and other important outcomes. That's uh, absolutely a, a, a good question, right? But I'm not sure exactly what you mean by adding to the collection of materials, because as I understand it, there's a very specific proposal process for um, teams of people who are directly funded by Carnegie and Gates and uh, Hewlett to produce open side materials like the sort of sanctioned versions. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you okay. so much. So the idea needs to be stemmed from that uh, paper that you sent us earlier? Yes. Okay. Kevin, another question picking up on that. At certain institutions, only professors can be PIs. So as an early career researcher, who will take the lead? They would have to have a professor as a PI. So it'd be helpful if you could provide some answers to this somewhat gray area. Um, yeah, that sounds a little related to the to the previous question. Well, it's not not exactly the same question. Um, I mean, that that's kind of why we our, our criterion is that the applicants can serve as PI. Um, So if you're not in a position to be able to be the PI, um, then you wouldn't be eligible. Um, can you give me an example? Like, is this, is this is something that just varies by institution, but these are, these are institutional rules? Because that's certainly not a, certainly not a, a, a requirement of NSF or IES that one must be a professor. Yeah, I, yeah, that is particularly uh, the institutional rule uh, that only a professor and sometimes even tenure professors can be uh, PIs. So even though I, if I were applying, I would be the main lead in doing everything. But for the, when you send the, if 
we get the grant, the grant has to go to the professor and may, who will have a, like an overview, an overlook, will overlook the project, but I would be taking the lead on doing anything else. But still in name, we will still have a professor who may be involved, not you know, sort of have a sort of a passive role. So that's why I was asking, is it possible if I, as an early career researcher, I could get the grant, but I would still have to have a professor as a PI. You know? um, yeah, let's, let, let's document that one too. Yeah. Uh, these are kind of the edge cases. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> we appreciate that folks are sort of bringing to the surface. Okay. Thank you so much. There's also a similar question from Emily saying they, that she's noticed a couple of us PhD students are here today. Would it be more realistic for us to identify a faculty member or a PI to work with if we're interested in applying? Or is this something you would consider a grad student for? Um, yes, similar question. We'll put that in the, in the list of things to, to, to nail down. Uh, very specifically, right? I mean, I think that the strongest vision we had, right, was that someone who was in a position to be principal investigator, right? That's what we used the example of a career grant, right, as kind of a, an exemplar, um, right? That if you're in a position to apply for a career grant, the whole point of career grant is to help launch careers and to provide early scholars with opportunities to lead proposals and to lead substantial work, right? To, to, to build a body of work, right? So that was, the, that was the main vision we had in mind, right? That if you're in a position to apply for a, for a, a, a career grant, right? Then, now, career is specifically professors, right? Like you actually have to be, I, was, I just looked at the RFP for career the other day and it says that you specifically have to be, I think a tenure track professor. So that's kind of a specific case. Um, you know, I, I did work with someone where we, we proposed, uh, for instance, a, a, a conference proposal to NSF, right? Where that person was definitely not a tenured faculty. In fact, they were a, they were sort of an associate research professor, a, a, a research professor, an untenured research professor, you know, who also was in a position to, to be a proposal lead, right, and was the PI of the resulting proposal. Um, but we'll, we'll, we will look at these edge cases in terms of the particular relationships and the constraints that specific institutions um, place. Right, so these are not constraints that are necessarily placed by funding programs, but by institutions. And they seem to vary across institutions. Hi, Kevin. Uh, this is Monica here. Um, I wanted to ask a quick question about um, if whether or not you all could provide some um, guidelines about how the proposals will be evaluated. Sort of like what are sort of indicators of promisingness? I know that this is intended to get things off the ground, but um, it feels a little bit amorphous. And so I was wondering if you could provide any sort of indicators for us um, who are considering submitting a proposal about what you all are looking for. I understand that it's broad, but uh, just some general guidelines. Yeah, I mean, um, we, uh, we've, again, we, we've left it open, right, in terms of what people can submit. I mean, it is only a concept paper and not a full proposal. So we're expecting a large variation in not just the ideas, but 
the format, the kind of ways that people choose to, to present, right? And so to be honest, like we, we don't have a rubric yet, right? Except to the extent that, you know, we know that we're going to prioritize three, these three main criteria, right? So we want to look at the application broadly, right? And it, you know, it, it, for instance, it'll, it's not just the proposal concept, but um, you know, the, the equity statement and the statement of what it is that you want to do with the funds, right? And to look at all that with an eye toward, you know, what is the idea's potential, um, you know, to be to turn into a competitive proposal, right? And in part, the competitiveness is deemed by, you know, these these three criteria, right? Does it address these particular needs and gaps? You know, does it center equity, which we think is a really important, you know, not only of course very important to our society, but also of importance to a lot of funders, right? That the the extent to which it centers equity is is very clear, um, right? And then you know, naturally, as part of a proposal, we're, we're want to propose. Um, open side related work, there should be a specific reason why it's open side related, right? If you could just swap out curriculum X, open side, right? Then the proposal isn't really conceived in a way that leverages what it intends to use, right? So these are all kind of related. Um, I don't know that I've given you any more useful detail than you, you already figured. But does that help at all? No, it does, Kevin. Thank you. Um, it, it's. I feel like what I'm hearing from you is that we should really look at sort of the three commitments for this open sciad research agenda and think deeply about how our proposed idea is sort of addressing all three of those pillars. And um, yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting from what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, they're very broad, right? And underneath that umbrella, right, is, of course, you know, the, the, the more clearly articulated and coherent it comes across in the, uh, in the concept paper, right? Well, you know, we haven't articulated clarity and coherence as a strict criterion. That, that'll, the, the clarity and coherence will be reflected in the extent to which these three criteria are addressed, right? So we're thinking of it as a very holistic criteria. Um, and uh, the, so we expect the smaller criteria to kind of emerge from those broad ones. I was just thinking uh, maybe if we could also, is there an opportunity for us like who's here to get into a smaller group or a small chat room, maybe we can discuss options and research questions. It's like, uh, is that one of the agenda that you have in upcoming sessions? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I didn't quite under, understand all of it. Oh, okay. So is there an opportunity for collaboration within the group and uh, the participants who are already in, like, you know, the session today? We can have, like, many uh, groups where we can talk, discuss ideas together, probably, so we could refine questions and things. So, and you, mean things prior, like you mean prior to the application deadline? Yeah. Oh, that isn't something that we were planning to facilitate, right? That would be on applicants' um, own. Their own, on their own. own. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, the, the, the support we would be providing would be to um, applicants who are selected for receiving the seed funds. And that support would start in February. I think I, I understand uh, Sama's uh, question here because it could be a little bit hard for some of us to find these collaborations. Uh, um, so maybe is there could be a way to house um, our curriculum vitae at some place, like if people wanted to contact each other, they could uh, something like that, where they can read about each other's work and maybe contact later on their own to um, begin a collaboration, uh, something like that. Also, I'm not sure if this is something that Open Science is doing the very first time, if there are any, any specific ex examples of successful seed grants from previous um, efforts, or things like that, that we could look at if there uh, exists anything like that. 
I am not aware of anything, as far as I know, at least in terms of this particular opportunity, this was completely conceived by Digital Promise. I'm not mm -hmm. saying other people haven't um, done this before, but this particular opportunity was conceived entirely by us as part of this larger grant from Carnegie. So I can't point to anything in particular. No, um, I was I was talking about OpenSide only. So I did not know if this was the very first time that you guys were doing, which it seems you are. Yeah. And it's a great effort. I really appreciate it. Thank you so um, much. Thanks a lot. Yeah, this is really great. So uh, yeah, following up on what the uh, how do you say your name? Menakshi. Manaki, <laughs> yes. Uh, I was wondering if there is like kind of a database for like, you know, the participants in this group or so we can see if we're doing something similar so we can collaborate and things like that. Or maybe we can start it right now. We can start like a Google Docs and see who's doing what. I see a question from Denise. Um about soft money. So yeah, uh, you're the same as us at Digital Promise. So we're, we're the same thing. And you know, as long as uh, you're using uh, the money, right? I'm assuming that if you have a structure like we, like we do where you're on multiple projects and you charge your salary to various projects, um, depending on what work you do, and you probably have, you may even have um, specific codes that you charge for uh, proposal work, right? then this can supplement that, right? And so you could charge your salary to this. That would be part of how you would use this, these funds to develop your idea. Thanks, I love that answer. Does, does that make sense? Am I, am I, am yeah, I good? yeah, that's perfect. It, you just did not mention it um, when you were talking on the slide about activities that were supported. You mentioned travel consultants, but you didn't say anything about supporting yourself. That's so. a good point. We probably should add that. Because we, yeah, we're in the same boat, so that would make yeah. sense. Thanks for okay, asking. Cool. Thank you. So Kevin, I'm hearing that a, a few people might benefit from being able to connect with other people who are in this group um, to collaborate on ideas uh, for the seed funding and, and for the, the actual proposal that they'll be working on. What we could do is if you are interested in sharing uh, your email address, let us know that and then we can create some kind of uh, way to connect people together um, where you can, you know, continue to contact one another and, and share ideas. So if, if you'd like to um, make yourself available to other people in this group, let us know that and we can facilitate that. Yeah, we are happy to matchmake. Um, uh, similarly, for, for those who were part of the working groups, right, you may be interested in connecting with people that you knew from there. We're also happy to facilitate those introductions. Okay, I'll just get into the Google Docs so for this book, so they can write their info there. And we'll leave this cool. We'll leave yeah, this you... a few minutes to, so for people to find that there is a link. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll just mention um you know as we get to the end of our session, um th thanks for attending. We're really excited about the potential proposals and eventually projects that may emerge from from this. And we just we, we're just really trying to lift all boats. Uh, we're really excited about the opportunity OpenSide presents and to try to get the most out of it. Um, we're pleased that I feel like we were able to answer most of the questions. There was just really one major kind of gap around the edge cases around who is eligible because of the sort of different constraints that different people's institutions place on who can lead. So we will give that some thought and clarify that as best we can when the application comes out um, so that, you know, we certainly don't want you to spend time preparing an application and it ends up that you really, we, we can't even consider you for funding because of those constraints. 
So, uh, and we're happy to communicate on, on an individual case by case basis in terms of determining whether uh, you're a good fit. So please feel free to reach out to me uh, just to clarify for your own particular situation, whether it's a, whether the opportunity works. Yeah, we may not be able to set, to articulate a set of rules that applies, that draws a line where you're either in or out, right? That may just not be possible given the range of different uh, situations people are in. But we'll do our best and work with people one-on-one -on -one to make sure you don't spend a lot of time on an application that you can't be considered for. All right. Well, thanks again for your interest. We look forward to hearing from you. And stay tuned for the application materials.